Will you please stand as we honor our graduates? At this time, we're going to honor our, our graduates, and uh, as they come up, I make them feel very welcome. The, this, is a, this is a great honor to be able to be here and to be able to have witnessed this year with them. Uh, so just make them feel very congratulated, this is a very, very big First one I'd like to call up is, is Kristen. I mean, Chris, sorry. You look like your mom. So <laughs> Cadence, <laughs> Cadence Armstrong. <laughs> Cadence, Cadence is a homeschool graduate. Uh, she will be attending Grayson College uh, she loves animals, and she wants to be a veterinarian. <laughs> Next I'd like to call up is Christopher Allen Barnett. <laughs> Chris is the son of Clay and Laura Barnett. His high school accomplishments is he was in the National Honor Society, uh, second team all district football, academic all state football, uh, and 2023 all Texoma land football second team. His clubs and organizations, he was a member of TCS Men's Service Organization. Uh, he has received the academic scholarship from Calvary University. Uh, his future goals is to own his own company and employ a lot of people. Uh, the university he will be attending is Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, and he is pursuing a business degree. Fun fact about Chris is that he plays guitar and enjoys writing music. He enjoys doing voice impressions of celebrities as well. <laughs> give, give Chris a round of applause. Next I'd like to call up is Aiden Baker. <laughs> Aiden is the son of Brian and Libby Baker. His high school accomplishments is he played baseball all four years and was varsity captain senior year. Uh, he's percussion section leader in band. He serves in the media ministry at church. Uh, his clubs and organizations as he has worked uh, as a student helper for the Grayson County Election Services. Uh, he has received academic and baseball scholarship from Dallas Christian College. Uh, his future goals is to get a degree and pursue a career in either the music industry or in metal and jewelry design. Uh, the college he will be attending is Dallas Christian College uh, and he will be pursuing a Bible and interdisciplinary studies. 
Uh, a fun fact about Aiden is he likes to do metalworking and has played uh, in four bands during high school. So give Aiden a round of applause. The next I'd like to call up is Owen Lawson. <laughs> Owen is the son of Buck and Maria Lawson. Uh, his high school accomplishments is he is a TA uh, distinguished degree, senior thesis defense, high school honors, uh, all American Homeschool World Series, all tournament pitcher, USA Baseball National Team Champion, uh, HSAA Baseball 2024 Offensive Player of the Year. Uh, his clubs and organizations is the, SS, is the HSAA Homeschool Athletic Organization, uh, Music Worship Leader, Home Run Ranch High School Ministry, and Dolan's Dodger Prime Baseball. He has received uh, the Southeastern Athletic Scholarship and Academic, academic Scholarship. Uh, his future goals is to play baseball as long as possible and to eventually become a lawyer, uh, to use both platforms to be a light to the world. Uh, he will be attending Southeastern Oklahoma State University and pursuing a business degree. And a fun fact about Owen is uh, he can solve a Rubik's Cube in under a minute. Next I'd like to call up is Jacob Thomas. <laughs> Jacob Thomas is the son of Shrinitra Mackey. Uh, his high school accomplishments is he's on honor roll, uh, career certification in financial responsibility. His clubs and organizations, he's been in choir, football, and track. Uh, he has received the Douglas Scholarship. Uh, his future goals uh, is to become a radiologist. Uh, the university he will be attending is University of North Texas. He will be pursuing a kinesiology degree. And a fun fact about him is his nickname is Big Feet. The next one is not able to be here with us today, uh, but it is David Halim Harris. Uh, give him a round of applause. <laughs> he is the son of Chad and Daria Harris, uh, and the grandson of Kay Harris. Uh, his high school accomplishments is he studies at the Tian Shan uh, International School, Almaty, uh, Kazakhstan, um, and he has been in sports medicine, volleyball, basketball. His team won first place in the City League and Central Asia Basketball Tournament two years in a row. Uh, Spirit Life, Director of Student Government, Events Committee Member of Student Government, and Youth Group Leader. Uh, scholarship he has received is an IMB scholarship. His future goals is he wants to follow the will of the Lord and to grow in his knowledge of spiritual topics and academics. Uh, the university he will be attending is California Baptist Universe, University, Riverside, California. Uh, the degree he is pursuing is a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And a fun fact about him, uh, he has been to 16 countries. Graduates, we are very, very proud of you. It has been such an honor to, to see you grow through this time, and it is such, uh, such an honor to see you finish out this season of your life. remain I 
I set my hope on Jesus For the deepest wounds that time won't heal There's a joy that runs still deeper There's a truth that's more than all I feel I set my hope on Jesus I set my hope
if you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so Take your Bibles, please, and open them to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 5. We're going to continue our study in this chapter this morning, picking up where we left off. We're going to begin reading in verse 5 today, and we will set the context in a few moments when we get back to the message, but we'll read these verses and then have a time of prayer. We'll read 5 through 12 in Daniel chapter 5. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing, and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. When an individual becomes so arrogant and so indignant towards God that open defiance toward him is their response, disaster is surely going to ensue. It's, it's kind of like sometimes people begin to become full of themselves moment by moment, day by day. And it's almost like whenever you begin to inflate a balloon and you continue to put air into that balloon and you continue to put air into that balloon and you continue to put air into that balloon until it pops. <laughs> Y'all awake yet? <laughs> Just checking. Well, you know the drill. You know how it works. And so the same sort of thing is true whenever an individual begins to become puffed up with themselves. There's only so much arrogance that we can carry. And Belshazzar becomes a picture of us, of a man who was so arrogant and indignant toward God that it's almost as if he was saying at this point in his life, I don't care about what this God thinks, says, or does. I'm bigger than He is. Now, that's a recipe for disaster. And this man has become so arrogant and so puffed up that he is now reaping the consequences of believing that he is bigger than God. 
Can I share a truth with you this morning? Simple statement. Accountability to God is universal. Everyone that breathes the air of this planet is accountable before God and will either answer to His promptings today as He draws us to Himself in love or answer to Him in judgment whenever He sees that the time is right. Here we basically see the message of judgment coming to a man and his kingdom and we learn from that that the unsettling message of judgment when it comes is something that must be dealt with. <laughs> this is a very interesting story, and if you just read through it, 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 it's captivating in the sense of what it's saying and how it says it. Think about this for a moment. These folks were gathered in this place, in the king's palace, and they were having this great celebration. And I re, if, I, if I can remind you, outside the walls of the city, the army of the Persians was camped and was ready to mount an offensive attack to overthrow that city and ultimately to take control and to, to exert power in the known world. And that was going to happen. That is what's going to happen. And here this king is, whenever all of that's taking place just outside the walls of his city, in there just partying away, saying, I'm not worried about them. I'm not worried about the prediction that this would happen. This doesn't affect me. It doesn't bother me. I'm Belshazzar. And I don't care what that God has said. This God has said, I have my own gods. And so he brings out these vessels from the temple, the holy temple of God, and uses them to continue the party while he worships the gods that are man-made gods of silver, gold, wood, so on. They're doing all this, this, this partying and this, this celebration of who they think they are. And then in verse 5, it tells us that in that same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared. Now this hand begins to write on the wall. And this will become the final message of judgment for this king and his nation that have treated God with such contempt, such defiance, and such disregard. Well, this isn't the only instance in Scripture where God has delivered such a message. And in this instance, among others, we see that sometimes God has peculiar methods of delivery of the message of judgment that He desires to bring. Those who have been the kind of people that can sift through the, the uh, archaeological remains of places that they've located have dug around in this particular area and, and have come up with some information about this particular place that they believe is accurate and true. They say that in the hall where Belshazzar was entertaining and celebrating and partying and worshiping his gods that were man-made, that this hall was a place that was about 170 feet long by about 60 feet wide, and the walls were about 40 feet tall. And while they were here in this place having this great celebration, it says that suddenly the hand of a man appeared and began to write words opposite the lampstand on the, on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. Now, now this wouldn't be like my hand writing on that wall. This would be a, a huge, visible, clear circumstance where this hand was something that appeared and began to write. And it was opposite the lampstand, so the, the shadows were even larger than the, the hand itself. And so this hand begins to write on the wall. That's a peculiar method of delivery of God's message. You know, there are other methods in Scripture where God has spoken judgment. And if you read back in the book of Genesis, you'll see that whenever the first word of judgment was spoken in the Scriptures, that the Bible says that the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And whenever He called to Adam, Adam, where are you? And Adam was hiding 
And God began to say, what you've done is terrible. This was just that, that contact that was one-to-one -one between God and a man. And later, God would pronounce judgment through Noah, and God used him, and God spoke to Noah, but then God used Noah to speak to the world by building this huge, monstrous boat. And the world thought he was crazy. But as the Scripture tells us, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, the righteous judgment of God for all this time that it took to build that ark. There's one time in Scripture whenever... God was pronouncing judgment on a man named Balaam, and he used a donkey to share a message of truth. A donkey spoke. So God doesn't always use conventional methods to help His people understand what He's up to. And this is one of those instances where God uses a, an unconventional, a peculiar method. God still does that, by the way. If you read in the book of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, this is what it says. It said, God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wisdom of this world. A simple message that is laced with gospel truth. God uses that to, to overrule the deep sophistry, the deep wisdom of the world who thinks they have answers for everything. This is the way God works. He, he uses some peculiar methods sometimes. God uses you and me to proclaim a message that the world needs to hear. And He is not limited or bound to a particular pathway, a particular methodology. His message of judgment comes as He sees fit to give it. By the way, do you know that the most vivid and profound message of judgment that God has ever delivered took place on a hill outside of Jerusalem? Do you know that that is God's declaration of judgment on sin, on the sinfulness of the world? Amen. And so that message of the cross, that, that cross upon which Jesus died, is God saying, I will judge sin. Amen. And what God does is He'll either judge your sin based on your faith in Jesus Christ, or He'll judge your sin and my sin based on my willingness to carry it and not cast it on Jesus. God uses some peculiar methods to teach us what He thinks about the unrighteousness that's in the world and how far He's willing to go to deal with it. And Belshazzar's about to learn that. He's about to learn in a very hard way. Well, this hand begins to write... And when this begins to happen, we see that not only Belshazzar, but I can tell you that others in the world that hear the message of the judgment of God, there are some predictable reactions that come when that message is delivered. Notice the first one. The Bible says that whenever this hand begins to write that the king's countenance changed, his thoughts troubled him, the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked together against each other. He, he was freaked out. <laughs> Fear gripped his heart. He was, he was having to participate in something, and he had no idea what was going on. This was something that had before been unseen, something that he had not had to cope with, something he had not to, had to deal with. Now, he thought that he was capable of handling the physical military onslaught of another army from a combative neighbor. He thought he could handle that. He was good to go on that. Let's just go fight him. We'll take him out and be done. We're Babylon. We can do what we want to. But this was different. This was obviously some sort of a supernatural presentation. And he couldn't get his mind around it. He, he, he was struck with fear in his heart. And so what does he do? He, he begins to try to understand it. Now he's, his fear is kind of giving way in a moment to confusion. He's, he's asking the question, what, what's going on here? What's happening here? I don't get this. This is beyond me. You know, I can tell you whenever God's people begin to try to communicate to this world around us the reality of God's 
hatred of sin and of his determination to judge those who rebel against him and decide to keep their sin, the world is confused by that. They, they think that we ought to just be able to go around and live like we want to and have no accountability before anyone. But I want to tell you something. Whenever we bow before a God who creates us, we also bow before a God who reserves the right to rule and reign in our lives. He made us. Why wouldn't He have the right to speak into our lives? And so it confuses the world. Well, uh, what happens next is, is pretty predictable. The king decides to call in all the wise men, to call in all the astrologers, to call in all the magicians, to call in everybody that he thought might have a way to figure this out. What he's basically doing is he's trying to deal with a supernatural dilemma with humanistic solutions. He's trying to, to fix something that is a supernatural catastrophe with humanistic mechanisms. Let's call in the people that we know. Let's do what we can. Let's figure this out. Let, let, let's fix this our way. After, after all, we have skill, we have ability, we have knowledge, we have wisdom. We have all the opportunities that we need to do something about this. So let's just figure this out from our humanistic mindset, our humanistic perspective. After all, we can do that. We can handle it. And whenever the world chooses that path, it takes it so far away from and out from under the control and the care and the keeping of God, and things begin to start coming apart at the seams, the world says, we can handle that. We've got ways we can fix that. Let's just print more money. <laughs> Bad economy? We'll just print more money. Well, there's a... a, a, a there are voices that, that don't want to adhere to the particular ideologies that would uphold morality and goodness and right living. Let's just make laws that allow whatever. Anybody can do what they want to. And we'll support them. We'll encourage it. We'll, just, we'll fix it with our human mechanisms, our human means, our human methods. Humanistic solutions to spiritual issues never are able to correct. So they want to bring in the astrologers, even to the point of promising a reward. And yet the results were poor results, and they walk away from this situation with a hopelessness still lingering in the air. Well, they are about to do something that I would recommend as a, as a consideration whenever things kind of begin to come off the rails. What happens after all this takes place is that the queen, it says, because of the words of the king, came to the banquet and said, O king, live forever. Now, who is this? this? This is a woman who is actually considered to be what is called the queen mother. She was not the wife of Belshazzar, probably the wife of his father, Nabonidus. The queen mother comes in, and mother provides some advice. My recommendation is whenever mother begins to speak, you might want to give consideration to what she's saying, because they often get it right. So the queen mother comes in, and she begins to speak to Belshazzar. And she says this, verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom. And, and I happen to know, because I've been around a while, I happen to know that in him is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. And then she says about him, in, in, in as much as there's an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel. Boy, she's... She's given him some accolades here. And so she says, you want to know what I'm going to advise you to do? Call Daniel. Because let me tell you about Daniel. I happen to know because I was there that Daniel is filled with the spirit of his holy God. A man full of the spirit can do more to address the calamities and catastrophes in the world than all of the brilliant people that do not have God in their lives. And so she said about him, he, he was able 
in days past to provide light, wisdom, understanding, because God is in him and he's walking with God. He's able to communicate to you the things that you're desiring to know. Not only is he able to provide light, but, but he doesn't do it in an arrogant kind of way. It says in him, there's an excellent spirit. He's someone that, that is winsome. He's someone that's able to, to speak the words of truth, but to do it in a way that doesn't come across as if he is elevated above you and better than you. He's gifted. He interprets. He solves riddles. He explains enigmas. <clears throat> He's someone who's capable of untangling confusing things. And by the way, Belshazzar, you're facing a very confusing thing here that needs to be untangled. So I recommend that you call Daniel. May I say to us this morning that God desires that the lost world would hear and understand the message of His truth. He wants the world to hear. And He's provided the ministry of proclamation, the ministry of instruction, the ministry of teaching God's truth to the world, to help the world understand where it's gotten off track, where it's taking wrong turns, where it's making wrong choices. Not because we're better, not because we sit in judgment, and not because we have a right to be harsh and to shake our fist in their face in our self-righteousness, but because we've discovered truth. We're, we're, the, we're the beggars that found bread who are telling the other beggars where they can find bread too. And so we have a, 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 a purpose and a responsibility to step out into this world and to share what we know to be true about God, His leadership, His work, His propensity to judgment whenever he's resisted to a point, the world needs to hear that. Not as, a, not, not as from a bunch of angry people, but as those who've found the truth, who've discovered it, and who are living in it. God wants the world to know. So let me just say a couple of things as we try to wrap up this morning. As God observes the ways of this world, I want to ask you a question. Do you think that divine judgment could be imminent? As God looks in on this world that we walk through, do you think that divine judgment could be imminent? I, I think that this world is on a, a very tricky path. And it's like, it's like leaning over a precipice. When, when will the scales tip? When will the balance carry the momentum over the edge? Only God knows that. But I think it's a question that we as the church need to ask. Do we believe that if this world continues in the path that it's on, that divine judgment might occur? We need to consider that question. Well, let me, let me talk to you about a couple of possible indicators that might say it could be. The first one that I would mention is this. Do you, do you realize that we are living in a generation when there is vast apostasy in the church? There are so many organizations that identify themselves as the church that God called into existence that have departed so far away from, from the, the truth of His Word that, that, that they dismiss the Scripture and replace it with social norms, cultural norms, whatever they choose, desire, want to, to, to be inclusive and to, to make themselves a group who doesn't seem to, to be willing to identify sin at any level. And that's in churches everywhere. Uh, I'm going to tell you, the, the, the Bible belt as we used to know it, buckle's broken. I'm telling you, it is. And so apostasy in the church, the twisting of Scripture... The ignoring of what God has expressly revealed in His Word is a real thing in many places that call themselves a church. I remember my oldest son who's here telling me that whenever he was up in northeastern Oklahoma that he went to a church. I think it was down in Arkansas, wasn't it? And, and in this church they were preaching, I think, in, out of the book of Hosea maybe. They were talking about Gomer who was... Uh, a woman of ill repute that that Hosea was sent by God to to 
help bring back to restoration to, to a relationship with himself, but also with, with Hosea. And, and he told me that they began the message with a song that is a secular song called, You Don't Have to Turn On the Red Light. And it's a song about overt prostitution. And it's a very secular song sung in a church. And then he said, then they, then they continued their whole service without ever opening the Bible. And they were a Baptist church. And I'm telling you, there's, there's apostasy in the church today. The second thing that I would say that may be an indicator that judgment might be looming, if not imminent, is just the audacity in our nation. The audacity to act as if God doesn't exist. And in many instances to say, even if He does, we don't care what He says. Right. Who is He to dictate to our lives how we should act, how we should behave, and who we should be? Taunting God. Daring God to prove Himself. That's happening in the world that we're walking through. So th these may be just a couple of indicators, and there, there could be an, a lot more, but these may be a couple of indicators that judgment might be looming if things don't change. So how do things change? How do, how do we as the church seek to be a, a deterrent? What, what, what are some possible deterrents that the church needs to take up to try to stand in the gap, to be that, that intercessor that Isaiah 59 talks about, to stand in the gap, to, to pray and plead for God and to act on behalf of God as He sends us into this world. Three things I think need to be true of us. The first thing is we have to have a, a, a spiritual discernment. We, we have to be willing to look with honesty at the Word of God and to hold that Word of God alongside the, the ways that the world is walking and to say, okay, where is there inconsistency there? Where does what the world says is right and good not match up with what the Word says is right and good? Yes. And so we need to discern that. We, we need to be able to look at God's Word and say, okay, that's not what needs to be happening out here. This is what needs to be happening out here. So we need spiritual discernment. We need to be like the, the Scripture describes the sons of Issachar who were aware of the times. Secondly, this is a day for courageous Christianity. This is a day when the body of Christ has to, 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 to step up and to be willing, even if it means to, to put ourselves on the firing line, to be counted for the cause and for the kingdom and for the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we need to be willing to take a hit if we need to, uh, to, 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 to speak into the world that is not drifting downstream, but has been caught by this roaring current and is being pulled along at rapid speed to the, to the precipice of judgment, in my opinion. So we need spiritual discernment. We need courageous Christianity. And finally, we need clear communication. We, we do not need to... Um, we don't need to, to make our message incoherent. There's a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament that speaks about writing the message plain and large so that those who run may read it. Basically, that's speaking about those who would be sent to deliver messages, that they would read messages as they ran from one place to the other. And they said, make the message clear and large so that those who run can read it. Folks, we need to, we need to make the message clear so that the world has no doubt about what we're trying to communicate. We're, 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 and we're not trying to tell them how much better we are than they are. We're trying to tell them how much God loves them. We're trying to tell them how much God wants to redeem, and how much God wants to restore, how much God wants to grant life in the place of death, how much God wants to give purpose and meaning, how much God wants to enjoy eternity with every single human being that He's ever created on this planet. We need to communicate that with clarity. Not, we don't need to be ambiguous. We need to be sure of what we're saying, and we need to say it 
loud and clear. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads, please. We come to a place this morning where the Word of God has been spoken. The truth has been proclaimed. And now every one of us in this room and those who are listening beyond this room have to decide, what does this mean for me? Well, for some who are listening, either here or in another place, you, you might be that person that has never come to the realization that what God was communicating on the cross was how He was willing to, to pronounce judgment on my sin, but to place that judgment on His Son and let Him bear that in my place. And, and today, the need that you have is the need for a Savior. You need a, someone to, to be your substitute. And Jesus Christ has done that, but he, he wants you to, by faith, say, I'm identifying with Him as my Savior. I'm trusting Him as my Savior. I'm pleading with Him for forgiveness and grace in my own heart, my own life. Today, I'm surrendering my life to Him as the only one who can take my judgment on Himself. Oh, would you trust Him today? Would you trust Him today? If you're in this room and you've never committed your life to Christ, in just a moment, our ministry staff will be right down here at the front of the church. We'd love to visit with you about that. If you're not clear, we want to help you. We want to bring clarity. We want to lead you and help you understand what it means to give your life to Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like God is prompting you to, to be one of those persons who's willing to take a stand in this world. Listen, you don't have to come to me or anybody else to make that commitment. You can do that right where you are. And God may be saying, listen, I, I want this church, I want you as part of this church to be counted for the kingdom and for the cause and for the King, Christ. Would you, would you just kind of renew your determination today to say, as best I can, Lord, I'm going to be courageous as a Christian. I'm going to try to understand the times and what's going on around me and what I need to speak into, and then I'm going to try to speak with clarity as God prompts and allows. Just commit yourself. Maybe you're here and you want to talk about some other things. Maybe there's, there are issues in your life that you need prayer with. You're struggling somewhere. We're happy to pray with you. We're happy to encourage you any way that we can. Just come to one of us. We'd be delighted to spend a few moments just praying over you. This is God's time, not mine. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Our men, are be, our men, men will be down front. You come as God so leads. Father, we come now in Jesus' name. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would move in our hearts and make clear to us what you desire as a response to your word. We love you. We praise you. We seek to honor you with every bit of our living. And we, we pray in Jesus' name. You come as we wait. You come. share some information with you that doesn't really come that easily. Over the past couple of years, there's been a growing realization that my time for full-time pastoral ministry was moving into its final phase. And I've had countless conversations with Kim and many pleadings with God that we would know when the right time had come for me to step back. We've also had conversations with our sons and other extended family, and they all understand and concur that there's a right time for this to happen. And I believe that time is very fast approaching. And I want to delineate several reasons for that, that I believe this to be true. First of all, as you know, there is tremendous growth that's happening in the Texoma area. This is a time for the church to be proactive and even aggressive in developing and implementing strategic approaches for navigating this growth. If I was someone who was going to take this church into its future, I would certainly rather be in place on the front side of this growth rather than onboarding whenever it's in full force. And so this would be a good thing for a new pastor and for the church. Secondly, 
Our family's been blessed to be here for nearly 25 years. In November, it'll be 25 years. Can you believe that? I can't even begin to express what a blessing this is to us. But this also means that I'm no longer young. You know, <laughs> it's obvious and clear. Uh, the church, I think, could benefit greatly from the presence of a younger man with a young family that would be a draw to other families coming into this community. Third, and this is just a little bit of personal information, I've now been in the workplace 49 years. Over 40 of those years have been invested in ministry. The last 35 years I've been beyond blessed. I've had a wonderful partner in ministry. My wife has also given of herself in countless ways to contribute to our calling as a ministry couple. We've invested hard. And frankly, we're a little tired. Over that span, there have been less than 10 times that I can count that I've been out of the pulpit on consecutive Sundays. Even when on vacation, much of that time has been spent with both Kim and I knowing that it was Sunday that would be here when we got back home and we'd have to step up and do it again. So you just don't get away from that. And we both know that we're moving into the final segment of our lives together. And we want to spend some time enjoying our later years. And we also want to spend some of it in ministry, but at a lighter level. We realize that our love for the Lord and for His church is undiminished. We still feel that we have much to contribute, but we want to do it at a different pace. So with that being said, I realize that there's some major adjustments that are going to be coming to this church and to our lives in the future. The personnel committee has been charged with mapping out plans and processes for filling vacant staff positions. And so I have met with them because I want this to be done right. And I've shared with them already the information that I'm going to give to you so that the church can begin to move forward with a well thought out process in place for recommendations to the church. So here are my thoughts, and the church can do with these what they will. Number one, I'm not one of those that wants to be involved in choosing a successor whenever my time here is complete. It's just not my way. So there will need to be a search process going forward that is established and put in place. My goal and my desire, and I'm, I'm telling you this early, because I want us to be able to, first of all, to process this. It's been 25 years. It's a long time for all of us. But I wanted you to know this. Uh, secondly, there's a little bit of wind of this going around the community, and I want you to hear it from me, not from somebody out there. Um, but I want to finish on December the 22nd of this year. That is the day that we will celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus in a special way, and we'll conclude that evening with the Lord's Supper, and that's what I want to do with my church. As our, as our final worship service. This congregation and pastor. So, my anniversary date of, for 25 years is November the 8th. I began in 1999 on that date. You remember that? <laughs> that means that 25 years will be marked from our ministry here. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I have a request, and this is what I want. I, I know that these things don't just happen, that there's always a, a time of formally saying goodbye or not goodbye. We're not relocating or anything. We're going to still be in the area and we're not moving our church membership. We'll get out of the way while new things begin to come into place, but we still plan on being a part of this lovely and wonderful church family at whatever level God allows us while still serving Him in whatever capacity He chooses going forward. But this is what I want to ask of the church. If we are going to do anything related to those formalities, I'm going to ask that we do those around that anniversary date and then just let the last few Sundays be worshiped together, if we can do that. Not, not uncluttered by all that stuff. Everybody knows how I love that anyway. It's just my favorite thing. So... <laughs> But again, these are suggestions, and I will certainly defer to the wishes of the personnel committee and to the church. 
And so I want to thank you for listening to us today. Um, again, and, and I'm not trying to just belabor this, but I'll tell you that uh, in 1981, when I started this journey, I did it believing that God was leading. And I had no idea where he was going. And I had a peace about following, even though it took a while for that to settle in and for directions to become clear. But when they became clear, I, I, I went full bore. And then when he called me to my first church as a youth minister, I'm not sure they agree with this, but I believe God was really in that. And we together served and, and had some great, I still have contact with people that I happened to be able to lead to the Lord during that, that time. And then whenever God led me to my first pastorate, I just had a complete peace. It was a, a rural church with a three-bedroom parsonage in me. And they loved me, and I loved them, and I spent four wonderful years with them. But when it came time to move to my second church, I just knew God was in that, and I had an extreme peace about that. And I met my wife there, and our boys were born while we were in that church. And then 10 years later, whenever God began to move us here, I, again, I, we worked through that and prayed through that, and the four of us packed up our little family, and we came over to Sherman, believing that God was leading us, and we had a peace about that. And we're there again. We're there again. We believe God has led us, and we, believe, we have a, a strong peace that this is what God has for us in this continuing season of our ministry. And so we appreciate your prayers, and we, you, you can't even begin to imagine how grateful we are for your love, your encouragement, your support. I, I can't tell you how many people through the years have said, I pray for you every day, every day. What a, what a wonderful, remarkable thing for an individual to be able to receive at the hands of God's church. We love you. Absolutely love you. We love this church. We love everything about it. But we believe it's time to hand it over and to move into our next season of life. And so uh, I, when I shared with the personnel committee, they were totally affirming. I've shared with a few other people that I thought needed to know this. They were totally affirming. Everybody I think seems to understand. And what I'm trying to share with you is, I think, logical, but I also think that it's God's will. And so thank you for hearing us out.